I want you to hit me as hard as you can. This quirky nerd slash scary badass has the acting skills to grow and build complex characters on screen, while also growing and building complex muscles on his body. Sometimes Edward Norton's muscles are green, and sometimes they're covered with swastikas. But don't worry, children, it's all movie magic make-believe. Just pretend. He's not really a Nazi. He's not really a smoochie. He's not really a bagel, Brad Pitt, or a Japanese dog. He's just a really good actor who can play anything. He's such a really good actor that he was cast to play a really good actor, and was even nominated for an Oscar for playing that really good actor in that Best Picture Birdman. And like his Birdman character, Edward Norton has a reputation as somebody who likes to have control over his projects, resulting in him sometimes being labeled as difficult to work with. But somewhere along the line, the brilliant Dr. Edward drank a potion and turned him into the monstrous Mr. Norton, like the Hulk. But is it true? Does Dr. Edward have a darker, more aggressive side to his real persona? Has this difficult behavior hurt his potential to truly be the best Edward Norton that he can be? Or is that what makes him and his film so gosh darn interesting? Let's find out on the latest episode of WTF Happen to This Celebrity. And today, children, our special WTF celebrity is... Sir Edward Norton. First, I'd like to say thanks for watching, like, share, and subscribe, and click that bell so you get those notifications on upcoming content. Now, back to the show. But to truly understand what the f*** happened to Edward Norton, we must start at the beginning, and the beginning began when he was born on his birthday, of all days, 1969 Boston. But he was raised in Columbia, Maryland. And we all know that sometimes actors grind their way through the business for years before they get their big break. Well, that isn't the case for Edward Norton, who was nominated for a motherfucking Oscar in his first motherfucking movie. WTF that. Yeah, in 1996 came the courtroom thriller Primal Fear opposite Richard Gere, who served as a mentor to Little Eddie. And of the 2,000 actors who auditioned for the part, Edward Norton was the one selected, and you know what? It was probably one of the best decisions ever made. Hey, you know what I can do with this thing? Well, how the fuck should I know? This is a spectacular, haunting performance. And like I said, got him his first Academy Award nomination and won him his first Golden Globe beating out Cuba Gooding Jr., if you care about the Golden Globes or Cuba Gooding Jr. I have literally no idea what to say at this moment. Um. <clears throat> yes, in Primal Fear, he delivers a truly amazing performance. Performances. And even though he was completely unfamiliar with how to work on a film set, Right away, he added his own specialties to the character, such as the southern accent and the stutter. I, I, I don't know. He, I, I don't know who's capable of such a thing, Mr. Vale. Of course, this has to be one of the best twist endings ever put on film, and it only works because Edward Norton is pitch perfect in this picture. Only the performance by Edward Norton a young actor making his feature film debut has some soul and wit, and I look forward to seeing him in another film soon. Hot off the success of the crime thriller Primal Fear, everyone in Tinseltown was waiting for Edward to bring us another twisted crime thriller. But in true Edward Norton fashion, he was unpredictable right away and did a musical, Everyone Says I Love You, from director Woody Allen whom Edward Norton would imitate years later in Sausage Party. And many say that this is one of Woody Allen's best films. And he has a lot of films. 
Edward Norton would then go on to work with another Woody, Harrelson, in another courtroom-based drama, Milos Forman's The People vs. Larry Flint. And of course, Edward Norton is absolutely amazing playing Larry Flint's young attorney. Obviously, when, when people criticize uh, public figures, they're going to experience emotional distress. We all know that. It, it's the easiest thing in the world to claim, and it's impossible to refute, and that's what makes it a meaningless standard. Really, all it does is allow us to punish unpopular speech. The year 1998 would see the release of that poker classic, Rounders, alongside Matt Damon. Rounders was not a very big hit, but as the years went by, the film's true legacy was revealed as several prominent professional poker players today say that this is the film that got them into the game. Many saying this is the best poker movie of all time. Hey, hey, all right, take it easy, take it easy now. Aren't you supposed to like read us our rights, please? <laughs> he would follow that up with the film American History X. And even though the film turned out to be a classic, this is the first instance where the entertainment industry would get a glimpse into the fact that Norton was a bit of a control freak when it came to his films, as he notoriously sat in on the edit session with the film's director, Tony Kay, and often disagreed with the director's vision. And Edward Norton disagreed so much and was so unhappy with the final cut of the film that he went and edited his own cut of American History X. So yeah, two cuts of American History X existed. You know, there was like a Bruce Banner cut and like a Hulk cut. Director Tony Kaye's cut was much shorter and less intense, you know, like Bruce Banner. And Edward Norton's cut was huge and intense, like the Hulk. And that epic Hulk-sized cut of American History X that Edward Norton edited is the masterpiece that the public would get to see. Yep, the studio went with Edward Norton's cut over the director's cut, which totally pissed off director Tony Kay. It pissed him off so much that he begged for the director's guild to allow him to be credited as Humpty Dumpty. Like Alan Smithy, but with more yoke. However, we all have to admit that Edward Norton's cut was pretty damn good. So maybe this control freak knows what he's doing. Critics everywhere called the film riveting and compelling. And this resulted in the second Academy Award nomination for Edward Norton. Edward Norton took a huge risk with this character. But he knew that if he pulled this off, Hollywood would never put him in a box. And yeah, in American History X, he destroyed that box. The film would not light up the box office, though, because it's not exactly for everyone. It's a black and white film about f***ing skinheads. So it's, not, it's not for everybody. Pulling in just $23 million off a $20 million budget but its longevity on home video has certainly made up for any lost revenue. And I actually went to high school with this one girl who would always talk about how sexy Edward Norton was in American History X. Like, it's just always awkward when somebody calls a Nazi sexy. Fuck you. Fuck you. His next film would be a box office bomb, yet an instant classic, Fight Club, opposite Brad Pitt. Or was he? Of course, the studio wanted a more bankable marquee name, like Matt Damon or Sean Penn, but director David Fincher insisted on casting Edward Norton. And like always, David Fincher was right. The film was released in 1999, the greatest year of movies ever. It opened up first place at the box office, but only made an underwhelming 37 million domestically, but would take in over 100 million worldwide. Unfortunately, the studio had no idea how to market this masterpiece. I remember seeing the trailer back in 1999, and honestly, I was not interested in seeing a movie about soap makers who punch each other. But later, I would learn that this movie is so much more. And as we all know, this film has kind of taken on a life of its own and is almost more than a movie now. 
Not sure if that's a good thing or a bad thing. The tone of Edward Norton's voice is perfect for this film, and it brings you right into the filthy Fight Club world, which we can't talk about. But this is a show where we talk about movies, so I kind of have to, I'm sorry. Fight Club has gone down as one of the biggest cult films to ever cult film. Are you in the cult? Then came the new millennium, and Edward Norton, who notoriously likes to have control over his films, would make it official by taking the leap and becoming a producer and a director of his first film. A romantic comedy, of all things, about religion, of all things, co-starring Ben Stiller, of all people. It's a movie called Keeping the Faith. Reviews were mostly positive for this film, and it would go on to make a decent, if not massive, 59.9 million off a $29 million budget. So yeah, way to go, director Edward Norton. He would follow that up by appearing in a film opposite his two acting idols, Robert De Niro and Marlon Brando, in a film directed by Frank Oz called The Score. Once again, Edward Norton's character plays a person with more than one persona. He's a not-so-innocent hotshot criminal who pretends to be an innocent person with special needs, doing his best Rain Man, slash I am Sam. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Nick. What? What'd you say? I said thank you, Nick. I'm Max's guy in the customs house. We should talk. The score has garnered some solid reviews, with everyone saying that the combination of Brando, De Niro, and Norton was any film fan's dream come true. And Roger Ebert, the guy with the thumbs, called it the best heist movie in years. And the score scored over $115 million at the box office. And it is truly amazing to see these three, the best actors of their generations, on screen together. And casting Edward Norton in this movie, The Score, was basically saying that this guy, Edward Norton, is the next De Niro and or the next Brando. And you know what? They just might be right. I think that's you trying to talk me into taking a sucker's share on a score that I set up from the beginning. Next was Death to Smoochie, a film that on paper should have been a hit. We get to see the sillier side of Edward here, but it's still dark as F. The film's writer said that when he was typing away, he saw no one but Edward Norton in the role. When Norton received the script, he read it in one single sitting, even commenting that when he reads a script, he generally has notes on how to improve it to perfection. But with Smoochie, he didn't want to change a single comma, although he did try to make changes to the wardrobe. Of course, just like with Fight Club, the film suffered from a marketing team that had no idea how to sell this thing, which saw the film crash and burn with just $8.3 million. Which sounds like a lot of money if you don't have $8.3 million, but for these Hollywood fat cats, it's nothing. Critics were no help to the film, calling it a misguided attempt, with a promising premise and a stellar cast. But those critics, they just didn't get it like with Fight Club. However, in the years since its release, the film has gained some respect, a lot of respect, for being a truly dark, dark comedy that actually predicted the over-commercialization and exploitation of children by way of television programming. Friends, friends, we all got friends, you got me and I got you. Then Edward Norton met Selma Hayek, and the two young lovers connected, like the eyebrows of Frida. Speaking of Frida, his next movie would be a smaller role in the biopic Frida, opposite his then-girlfriend Selma Hayek, who asked her then-boyfriend Edward Norton to rewrite the Frida script. And he did just that because that's what good boyfriends do. He rewrote Frida. 
The Writers Guild refused to give Edward Norton credit for his perfect rewrite, which made Eddie Boy furious. Like the Hulk. The film Frida received strong reviews, mostly for Selma Hayek's Oscar-winning performance, and would go on to make $56 million worldwide. It's my painting on my wall. It's the people's wall, you bastard! Norton would next be seen in the Silence of the Lambs prequel film, Red Dragon. Directed by Brett Ratner, of all people. And Brett Ratner or not, once again, Edward Norton was determined to have the film made the way he wanted. And when Eddie Boy arrived on set, he brought new pages to the script that he had written himself. Obviously, this caused some drama on set. But Red Dragon still managed to be a decent film. And audiences showed up to a tune of $209.2 million. Next would be a Spike Lee joint, The 25th Hour. Edward Norton is a huge Spike Lee fanboy, and it was a dream come true to work with the visionary filmmaker. Critics praised Spike Lee's direction and Edward Norton's performance. The two make a great cinematic team. Edward Norton is truly fearless in this one. It made $23.9 million at the box office, which is good because it only cost $5 million to make. Then came the year 2003, where we would see Edward Norton begrudgingly appear in the remake of The Italian Job. Norton notoriously, Norton oriously, did not want to star in the film, but he was forced to in order to fulfill a contractual obligation to Paramount. According to several reports, he made this fact very well known on set. He was like, hey everybody, I don't want to be here. And Marky Mark was like, why? However, even when Edward Norton doesn't want to be there, he still makes kind of good movies. And The Italian Job became a pretty good mindless escapism film, with some fun action sequences and a charismatic cast. So yeah, The Italian Job, it was a huge success and made lots of money. But of course, Edward Norton did not give a f after doing a favor for his Red Dragon director, Brett Ratner, by appearing in a cameo in the film After the Sunset, he would appear as King Baldwin IV in Ridley Scott's epic Kingdom of Heaven. Reviews for this film were split upon its theatrical release. However, many critics did single out Edward Norton's performance as one of the bright spots of the film, calling it phenomenal and revealed the true complexities of his talent. And I believe his face is covered up throughout the whole film. I remember seeing this one in theaters and being mesmerized by this masked performance. And even though I'm a huge Edward Norton fan, I had no idea that this was Edward Norton, which is a true sign of a great actor. But yeah, most everyone said that this was a, a nice epic that lacked depth. But those opinions have since changed after seeing the director's cut on DVD and Blu-ray, which is actually 50 minutes longer, which made many people change their minds about this film being mediocre to actually being another masterpiece. So yeah, once again, there's two versions of an Edward Norton movie. One's bigger, stronger, meaner, and cooler. Like the Hulk, or Tyler Durden. I pray you retire on home to Damascus. Reynaldo Chatillon will be punished. I swear it. And after doing that massive epic that is Kingdom of Heaven, he would do a more personal tale that he also produced called Down in the Valley. Reception of this film was mixed with Roger Ebert, the guy with the thumb, saying that he was glad he watched it and said that Edward Norton's performance was stellar. Then came Stella. He was in episode one. Anybody remember Stella? I thought it was really funny. In 2006, he would play a magician in the underrated Illusionist movie. The film turned in a solid performance at the box office with 87 million, and the reviews were pretty good. It was engrossing and well-crafted. And yeah, The Illusionist, it's really good. I like The Prestige better, though. Edward Norton would follow that up by producing and starring in the big screen adaptation of the 1929 novel, The Painted Veil. 
opposite Naomi Watts. Critics enjoyed this film. Norton and Watts, they had what you call chemistry, and Edward Norton would garner an Independent Spirit Award nomination for his work in this film. Then the year 2008, the Marvel Cinematic Universe was born, kinda. And some people may actually forget that Edward Norton was, at one point, a member of this cinematic universe, when he played Bruce Banner in The Incredible Hulk. They allowed Norton to be brought on as a writer as well. However, his tweaks and changes to the script were not enough to secure him a writing credit for the film. Mostly because most of his writing was last-minute rewrites, resulting in pretty much them shooting two movies at once, and hoping at the end it all comes together in post. We'll fix it in post. Once again, like a Bruce Banner cut and a Hulk cut. Marvel's cut was a little safer and less threatening, like Bruce Banner, and Norton's cut was dark and full of rage, like the Hulk. And these two edits resulted with Edward Norton butting heads with the studio and the director, as he often does. This resulted in Edward Norton reportedly refusing to promote this Hulk movie, as he was not satisfied with the final film. Norton has since refuted that claim, though, saying that there were some behind-the-scenes issues. But the mainstream media has distorted the facts! Just for a good story. Hashtag fake Hulk news. And this Incredible Hulk film was released shortly after the massive success of Iron Man. And it performed fairly well, if not right out phenomenal pulling in $264.8 million worldwide. And everyone was like, hey, at least it's better than the Ang Lee Hulk. And of course, right here, this one would be a career-best domestic box office for Edward Norton. But not all is well in the world of Marvel. The film was envisioned as the first part of several films. However, none of those got off the ground when the cast of the Avengers was announced, and many took notice that Edward Norton was not Edward Norton, he was Mark Ruffalo. Yeah, Mark Ruffalo was now the Incredible Hulk, and everyone was like, yeah, that's, that's fine. <laughs> Nobody really cared. Not even Edward Norton cared. But this did lead to much talk around town that Marvel Studios did not invite Edward Norton back because he was difficult to work with. <laughs> However, Edward Norton maintains that it was his decision not to return, saying that he wanted more diversity on his filmography and did not want to be known as one single character. He claims that if he stuck with the Hulk, he would have never worked with Wes Anderson, which we'll get to in a moment. Edward Norton would next be seen in the drama Pride and Glory opposite Colin Farrell. The film was released with lukewarm reviews, calling it formulaic and cliched. Then he did a pretty hilarious cameo as a cop in the Ricky Gervais film The Invention of Lying. It's one of those times where you're like, hey, hey, is that Edward Norton? And then you're like, yeah, it is, oh my gosh. Another one of those times is in Modern Family. Yeah, that's right, he appeared in an episode of the show, season one, episode A. In the year 2010, we would see Edward Norton take a drastic pay cut to appear in dual roles, two characters, for the Tim Blake Nelson directed Leaves of Grass. The film cost $9 million to make, but would only make $1 million back. But it had positive reviews with most everyone praising Edward Norton's performances, plural, as twins in this movie. He's so nice, they did it twice. He would again appear alongside Robert De Niro in the thriller Stone. The film received mixed reviews from Roger Ebert, the guy with the thumbs, praising the work of Edward Norton and Robert De Niro, but it didn't make that much money. And, you know, in this business, money's important, apparently. I'm different than when I come in here, man. I've grown a lot. I'm, I'm like, I'm like fucking reborn, man. 
In the apocalyptic year of 2012, Edward Norton would kick off what would turn into a long collaboration with Wes Anderson when he starred in Moonrise Kingdom. Wes Anderson said that after he finished the script with Roman Coppola, he saw only Edward Norton in the role of Scoutmaster Ward. And yes, Edward Norton is a perfect fit for the quirky, symmetrical world of Wes. One of those amazing ensemble casts. This one actually kind of made some money. 68 million at the box office. It's good for a Wes Anderson movie. It's very whimsical and, uh, you know, just lovely. And it's really good if you like Wes Anderson movies. He would appear as himself in a cameo in the Sasha Baron Cohen film, The Dictator. Hey, Eddie Norton, next time you pee on me. Whatever. He would next be seen in the Bourne film that does not feature Jason Bourne, The Bourne Legacy, a film that I completely forgot existed. But this would make a ton of money, 276 million which would be Edward Norton's highest grossing worldwide film ever. Next, he would appear as a guest on The Simpsons. Season 24, episode 18. And host Saturday Night Live. Season 39, episode 4. As well as appear in that SNL anniversary special. Edward Norton would follow that up by reuniting with Wes Anderson. For the Academy Award nominated film, The Grand Budapest Hotel playing the police investigator. The film would go on to be praised as a masterpiece and was nominated for nine Academy Awards that year, including Best Picture. The film would also represent a Wes Anderson best with 172 million worldwide at the box office. And once again, Edward Norton is the perfect fit for the quirky symmetrical world of Wes. Who's shooting who? Another film that came out that same year that would also receive nine Academy Award nominations, including Best Picture and would win, and that film is Birdman, where Edward Norton would play an actor who is difficult to work with, a role given to him due to his uh, reputation in Hollywood. This would result in Edward Norton receiving a third career Oscar nomination well deserved. And this film was shot to look like one continuous shot and would be hailed as yet another masterpiece. I use that word a lot, but I mean, he's made a lot of them. And many critics took note at the acting in particular. Every single performance in this film is stunning. And Edward Norton is, you know, one of them. The film would go on to make over $100 million off an $18 million budget. And yeah, this unique superhero movie would of course win best picture of the year at the academy awards and nothing much has changed and you guys know that if you crank out any toxic piece of crap people will line up and pay to see it but long after you're gone i'm gonna be on that stage earning my living bearing my soul wrestling with complex human emotions edward norton would then take his voice and use it for the adult animated film sausage party where, like I said, he plays a bagel with the voice of Woody Allen. Sausage Party would go on to become the highest grossing R-rated animated film ever, with a healthy 140 million worldwide take at the box office. Many critics called it offensive and profane, but in a good way, because that's what it was supposed to be. Next, Edward Norton would once again join a strong ensemble cast in a movie that's not so strong, Collateral Beauty, and is probably the worst thing Edward Norton has ever been in. It's probably the worst thing anyone's ever been in, but Collateral Beauty still made money, and that's all that matters. After appearing in the English language dub for the Chinese film The Guardian Brothers, Edward Norton would reunite with Wes Anderson and Wes Anderson would put Edward Norton's voice into a dog, a stop-motion dog, in the film Isle of Dogs. Most everybody found this film to be beautiful and charming, and this one would go on to make over 64 million at the box office. And once again, again, Edward Norton was a perfect fit for the quirky, symmetrical world of Wes. 
Then he roasted Bruce Willis while also roasting Marvel. Then he would appear in an unrecognizable cameo in Robert Rodriguez's Alita Battle Angel, playing the role of Nova in the final seconds of the film. Spoiler alert, I guess? And this role is meant to be expanded on in the sequels, if they ever make the sequels. Then he would write, produce, and direct the noir film Motherless Brooklyn, playing a man with Tourette's syndrome. I hear this is a pretty good film, but it ultimately underperformed at the box office, and critics found this one to be a little too long. But of course, everyone loved the stellar performances by everyone in this cast, so I guess it's worth a watch. And writer, producer, director, actor Edward Norton would go on to win the Auteur Award at the Satellite Awards. I got threads in my heads. I got threads in my heads. Edward Norton would then reunite again, again, again with Wes Anderson for what looks to be like the most Wes Anderson film to ever Wes Anderson, The French Dispatch, which like just came out, so I haven't seen it yet. The film was originally sent to be released in the year 2020, but you know what? They decided to shut the whole f***ing world down, and that included movie theaters. So the French Dispatch opened to a limited release on 52 screens, marking this as the best per screen average of the COVID-19 pandemic. Congratulations. And there it is, Edward Norton in a nutty ass nutshell. This guy busted his way into the industry, fearfully primal, with an Academy Award nomination right off the bat and a Golden Globe win if you care about the Golden Globes. And this guy, Edward Norton, he has continued to make films at a high level, pretty gosh darn consistently. He's a guy who knows what he wants and has no problems making sure everything is done to the highest quality possible. Yes, sometimes he can be labeled as difficult to work with. But when you look at the guy's body of work, when you scroll through his IMDb, all you see is quality. Some see Edward Norton's controlling onset behavior has led him down a path of career self-destruction. But could this demand for perfect perfection for his artistic vision actually lead him down a path of pure creative freedom? Only Edward Norton's future projects can determine that cinematic fate. And I hear he's gonna be in the Knives Out sequel, so... So yeah, there's that. He's an actor that when you see him, you know that you're getting a performance that is nothing short of 100%. And you know what? That's all I can really ask. And because of that, whenever you see his name attached to a project, you can expect something truly special. And you know what? Mr. Edward Norton does not need a super duper franchise. He has made a name for himself as a true unpredictable magician, an illusionist who can transform into anything. So nobody should give a f about what the f happened to Edward Norton because he's doing just fine. So I am going to go ahead and end this WTF video about Edward Norton right now, before he Hulk smashes me and re-edits this himself. Thank you for watching our show. If you like what you see, please subscribe to our Joe Blow Videos channel. Tell your friends who like this sort of content, and turn on the bell to receive notifications for all of our latest videos. We're an independent company, and we appreciate all your support.